Good morning, welcome to my channel. I'm Dr. Paul Kiritsis and today I'll be continuing with the uh, short blog tour on the Greek gods and goddesses. Um, the topic of today's uh, discourse is the goddess Athena. Athena, or Pallas Athena, as she is sometimes called, uh, is the preeminent Olympian patroness of civilized life, warfare, and the metalworking of weaponry, agriculture, as well as moral virtues such as justice, balance, balance, orderliness, and wisdom. So what the ancient Egyptians called Mart. She was also an avid defender and corroborator of the reputed Greek heroes, uh, Perseus, uh, Heracles, Jason, and Odysseus. The latter of these was also her personal favorite, so what I call her best beloved. Um, according to the classical myths, Athena was the progeny of Zeus alone. Uh, she was his blood and seed made in his image alone. Uh, perhaps this is why uh, she was also his favorite child. Uh, in one of the most commonly cited interpretations of her birth, Zeus embarks on a furious affair with Metis, a daughter of the mighty Titans, oblivious to an oracular prophecy uh, declaring that any children born uh, to the latter uh, would carry a supernatural and omnipotent fervor uh, more potent or greater than their sire. Uh, so any child born to, th uh, to Metis would um, out outdo uh, his or her father. Uh, Realising his mistake, Zeus swallows Metis in hope that any impending conception would die within her. But this, is not, this, this was not the case. Shortly afterwards, he experiences an intense and debilitating headache, uh, akin kind of to like a migraine, uh, and to relieve, uh, to relieve him of his suffering, uh, of his suffering, a horde of fellow Olympians basically cleave his head open with a Minoan axe, um, which is called a labrus, a lavris. The violent blow liberates an ululating Pallas Athena, who springs forth from atop his head bedecked in a full suit of armor. Foremost of her epithets is grey-eyed or flashing-eyed, most fitting because of the inextricable qualitative connection between the color grey and the concept of divine wisdom uh, over which she presides. So there's a connection between grey and wisdom, hence why when we get old, we like to think of ourselves as wiser and grey. Uh, she was also called Parthenos, a word which denotes maiden or virgin in Greek, and sheds ample light upon the decision to name her principal temple of worship on the Acropolis the Parthenon. In fact, the virgin goddess was a lot more than just the principal um, deity worshipped at, Athenian, at the Athenian Acropolis. She was the sole patron of the entire city. In a renowned local legend, we learn that in a time before this, there was a frantic quarrel uh, between Athena and Poseidon concerning sovereignty of the over the beautiful city. The unanimous verdict amongst the Olympians, the city's residents and the contestants themselves was that patronage would be granted to the conferrer of the best gift. So he or she who gave the best gift would also become the patron of the city. Hoping to woo, uh, to woo the masses uh, with his sheer strength, Poseidon generated a pressurized uh, saltwater spring atop the Acropolis by striking his trident on the ground. Athena, on the other hand, uh, was a lot more subtle uh, in her ways. Um, she was craftier as well. Uh, she basically uh, jabbed her foot against the earth um, and the first domesticated olive tree sprung from the dirt. So the first gift, uh, Poseidon's gift, was quite impressive, but it was useless, seeing that salt water was undrinkable. Uh, the second appeared much more modest, though it hid a truant potential. Um, wood, oil, and olives, all of which were useful. So wood can be used in the construction of living quarters, Oil and olives, of course, can be eaten or consumed. Uh, for these reasons, the victory was awarded to Athena. In Homer's Iliad, Athena takes the side of the Archaeans, the Greeks. 
to understand why, all we need to do is look at the judgment of Paris, uh, the prologue to the Trojan War. The Olympian gods and goddesses were not ones to take knockbacks lightly, especially when they were of a personal nature. In the same way, Paris's act of gifting the golden apple to uh, the beautiful Aphrodite over here enraged Athena to the point that she never quite forgot it. Hence, when the agglomeration of events that followed Aphrodite's acquisition of the golden apple flowered into a full-fledged uh, war, Athena fought vehemently uh, and furiously against Paris and his people, the Trojans. Athena's intervention in this nine-year war was pivotal, for it instilled the Greek forces led by Agamemnon of Mycenae with the requisite cunning to finally breach the formidable walls of the city and slaughter the inhabitants. Indeed, the conspiracy to bring down the city by constructing a hollow wooden horse and presenting it to the Trojans under the pretense of a gift was exclusively her idea. In the end, the horse wasn't a gift at all, but rather a trick-ticking time bomb nursing a horde of dormant Greek warriors uh, who would emerge after nightfall and assail the Trojans unawares. In the sphere of created nature, the olive tree, as well as the owl, the serpent, and the horse were all sacred to her. And her Latin equivalent is Minerva. That's all for today, and I'll see you next time.